Welcome to Get Better Basketball Live. I'm Coach DeMarco, and joining me today is Coach John Palicki, head basketball coach at Resurrection College Prep. Coach Palicki is going to give us a complete breakdown of his matchup zone. You are definitely going to want to check out this episode. Before I jump into it, make sure you hit that like button down below, turn on your notifications, and subscribe to my YouTube channel for more great video breakdowns each and every week. Another Get Better Basketball Live is up now. Coach DeMarco here with Get Better Basketball Live, and today my guest is Coach John Palicki, head basketball coach at Resurrection College Prep. Coach, thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me on. I'm, I'm really excited. As I said, I'm normally the, the guy that asks the questions, so I'm happy to, to be the guy that gives some answers today. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited because I know we're going to talk matchup zone, and I feel like that's a topic that there's not a ton of stuff out there on. I feel like coaches are always looking to learn more about it. And, you know, there's some nuances depending on, you know, the coach. There's some different th things you could do differently within a matchup zone. So I'm curious and just want to ask first, where did you learn how to play a matchup zone? How long have you been using it? And just maybe give us a little bit of background on, on um, you know, with you and, and the matchup zone. So, you know, it's, it's actually, I got two unique stories that, that people always kind of laugh at, but uh, my first year as a head coach, I was a straight man pack line guy. And, you know, we struggled a little bit and, and I'm, I'm very free flowing in my offensive uh, thoughts. And, and I thought to myself, you know, what does everybody do against a, a man to man? There's, there's hundreds of options, but against the zone, there's, there's not, you know, most people have one, two zone offenses. So two quick stories that, that everybody always finds interesting. We were playing a team and uh, they were definitely more athletic than us. And we decided that we were going to try just different zones. So uh, we, we, in that one game, we played a two, three, a one, three, one, a one, one, three, and kind of like a two, one, two gap uh, some people refer to it as the buzz. And it, it's a, it was a big gym. It was like a, a barn build gym and my kids couldn't hear me. And I thought, okay, they can't hear me. What am I going to do? And all of our zones that we always teach is by color. So like a two, three is orange, obviously after Syracuse, a one, three, one is blue after Michigan. Um, and then our one, one, three, it was red after uh, UNLV. And then our, our other defense was green and my kids couldn't hear me. So I started to just try to find things that were different colors. So I, I unscrewed a Gatorade cap cap and I was holding up the orange Gatorade cap. If I wanted orange, uh, I was holding up a, my, uh, my towel that wiped my whiteboard off. That was blue. I asked my coach to take his jacket off, which was red. So that, that was a, that was a crazy day, but that that's kind of how I fell in love with the zones. Um, just because I, I felt like it, it gave my team an advantage. It gave us a unique way to prepare for opponents. Um, and then this year uh, we, we kind of added a unique element. I did it my second year, one game in a regional championship, but this year we kind of committed to it, which was lots of teams play some kind of zone press into a man to man. Well, we decided we wanted to try a man to man into a zone press again, just to give ourselves a little bit of an advantage, something unique, something that, that people don't, that uh, people don't uh, see a lot. So I guess they always say, you know, uh, you do whatever is necessary at that time. Uh, innovation comes from necessity. So I guess that that's kind of how we came about it. Those are some great stories, coach. I like uh, the different colors, the different objects, uh, you know, with, with the zone, uh, zone defenses. So just give us a little bit of background, um, you know, on how you teach uh, your, your matchup zone and then, maybe just some of the basic principles. I know we're going to get into some diagrams and maybe even some video clips later on, but just curious about some of the, the basic principles of, of your matchup zone. So I, I think obviously it's really important to have those man principles. Um, you know, like when we are in our two, three matchup amoeba, you know, the things that man to man teams or man to man coaches would say like high foot force towards the baseline. Don't let the ball be reversed. Um, no threes, no layups, force the long two. Those are all key concepts in our, in our matchup zone. Um, I had at 
was fortunate to have a conversation with uh, Luke Yaklich of UIC and, and his big thing was force one long two. And that was kind of my thing. Okay, you know what? We're going to force one long two. So, you know, I, I think all those key concepts, you know, they, they flow, whether you're man or zone. As a man or a zone coach, you have to understand and you have to decide, do you want to give up baseline or, or do you want to shade baseline? Do you want to shade oh. middle? Either way, whether you're in man or zone, that your kids have to know that. Your, your kids have to know, how do you want to defend the ball when it's in the high post? How do you want to defend the ball when it's on the wing? Um, you know, how do you want to defend the ball off a, a, a baseline screen versus an inside screen? So it's, it's all those things. You know, I, I think a lot of the times people will say, you know, oh, you run a zone. Well, no, don't think of it as, oh, we run a zone. We run a zone that's just like your man, just in a little bit different formation. So you know, we've had referees say to me, oh, you run a very different zone. Well, no, we don't really run a different zone. You know, we just, we took ideas from Bayheim's 2-3 um, or, or Mike Hopkins in Washington, that 2-3. We took ideas from the Amoeba, from Tarkanian, and we took ideas from a man-to-man and we kind of just combined them all into one. So sometimes a little bit, it's kind of about tricking your kids. They don't think you're running man-to-man, but you really are. It's just in a zone format. Yeah, I, I honestly, it's something, you know, for me, um, I didn't do it in my last couple of years when I, when I was coaching and I had a, a pretty experienced team. We had been full court pressure, uh, run and jump, man to man team. And for us, I'm, I'm like, you know, I want to do something a little bit different. I've been watching Rick Patino for years at Louisville and I was so intrigued at, at their matchup zone and the principles and things that they were doing. So I started to pick up on some of those ideas and we started to incorporate that. And throughout the season, it was a nice wrinkle for us, um, you know, actually helped us win a couple of uh, games against some really tough opponents. And um, I, I kind of fell in love with it. And I feel like if I got back into coaching, I would want to incorporate some type of matchup zone. Maybe it wouldn't be all we did, but it would be some type of wrinkle for our team. So really, really like it. And I want to ask, because I know some things that come up uh, with the matchup zone. And one of the things I want to ask is, is ball screen coverage. You know, maybe, you know, I found that a lot of teams thought we were just playing zone without any man-to-man principles. So they got into their zone offense and it was really easy for us, you know, to defend that. But then teams start to realize, all right, this is a little bit more switching and man-to-man. So we're going to try to set some ball screens. So just curious, do you see ball screens against your zone? And, and what do you guys uh, like to do against it? Yeah, we, we definitely do see some ball screens, um, you know, and I'll get into it a little bit. But, you know, against a, an inside ball screen, so inside one of the guards, you know, for us, it's really big that our guard goes over the top. Um, we, we want to make sure I, we talk about to our guards all the time and, and our forwards, but definitely our guards and, and we're not going to give up a three pointer. So, you know, we really want to make sure that those guards go over the top. Cause let's be honest, if the player rolls, they're rolling into the five or, or the post anyway. Um, you know, we don't really use the, the one, two, three, four, five. I, I kind of, you know, a lot of people will come on and say offensively, they, they view it as positionless. I view defensively as positionless. So, um, but it, as I said, you know, the rollers rolling into the, the post player in the middle anyway. So that's fine. Roll that I'm okay with that. There's a person waiting for you. So that guard understands like, I don't have to worry about the role. All I have to do is not give up the three. So if I really hedge over that screen, really get over that screen and don't give up a three, okay, my teammate's going to help me out, especially in a zone. If you think about it against an inside screen, where's that opposite guard in the two, three, they're in the high post anyway on the ball side. So as that guard attacks, that's okay. You're attacking into the guard that's already standing there waiting for you. So you know, we're, we're definitely okay with that. And if you want to kick it to the three, that opposite forward, they're standing there waiting to take away that three. And I'll get, I'll get into in a little bit, what happens if they do that double pass to the corner for a three. But um, so that, that's kind of our thing against an inside screen against an outside screen. We actually like to, if you can visualize it, coach, we like to what we call X action, which is that second guard 
will actually step up and take that that uh, I coach girls basketball. So that that girl that comes off the screen while that that girl that got screened mm -hmm. then goes into the high post. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like an X kind of action where they kind of switch as a run and jump. Think about if you're you're guarding in a run and jump and they set up a, a screen to get the, the ball in bounds and the girls, the, the guards just switch. That's kind of how we defend an outside screen. Yeah, that that's really good. And you know, I, I know there's different different perspectives on on with the matchup zone, things you can do. So appreciate hearing what, what you guys do. And I actually really, really like both of those, um, defending the inner and the outer, um, what you guys do against it. Um, I have a couple of other questions I feel like will flow kind of as we take a look at the diagrams and some of the video clips. So I'm gonna hold off because I'm excited to have you share first off the diagrams and then maybe some video uh, of you guys in action as well. So this is kind of our base set. Obviously we're out of a two, three. And again, a lot of our principles come from that Syracuse, uh, Jim Beheim, uh, Mike Hopkins, two, three. That's kind of what we teach as the base before we get into a little bit more of the amoeba concepts because they're a little bit more complicated uh, than just a base two, three. So on any wing pass, again, in a two, three, the forward's job is to take away the three. The guard's job is to take away the drive. And we're big. We practice a lot. We talk about a lot that push down. And we emphasize, we actually want you to push your teammate down, physically push them down. Don't make any confusion because what happens if there is confusion, they both either run at the three-point shooter or neither one of them run at the three-point shooter. So we really want that communication and that push down on the wing pass. So let, let's go over a couple actions. And I know, uh, you know, we had talked about just a, just a couple of different actions. So the first one is if you have a deep corner, a short corner, and a high or low post. Okay, so this is like the ultimate overload. This is like if somebody wants to put everybody on the one side. Essentially, as I said, kind of with our defense, it's, it's a matchup zone. So as you can see in this set, it became a straight man-to-man. -man. X1 is on two, X3 is on three. The middle or the post is on the short corner. The opposite side forward has moved all the way over to the block, which this is actually sometimes our weakness. I need my forwards to move all the way over, which sometimes they don't. Now, if, if anybody's ever watched the Hopkins or the Bayheim, you know, two, three, the key for this guard is that they have to deny the high post, but on the high side, if they get stuck down here, you're going to give up this kickback three. So essentially they have to be able to guard the high side here and the kickback three. So this, this is a, this is a tougher job. Now, if there is no deep corner, as you can see in this set, this is actually a little bit easier for us to guard because now the forward doesn't have to go all the way out. They can just guard the short corner. This post can guard the strong side or ball side right here in the, in the, in the block. And then this forward would move over if they have to. Again, two's job is the same. Now in this action, four, because five has the post here, four is actually in charge of three and if they can, two will get here, but if they have to, four can get here. So four and two are essentially in charge of these three right now. If five slips, that's fine. I tell our girls all the time, five's already here, so that's fine, slip. You gotta stay on the high side so we don't give up the three. This is where it gets a little bit into the amoeba action. So as I said, if the ball's reversed all the way around or if five at any time has to evacuate, okay? Because again, we're not going to give up a three. As I talked about, we're very positionless. If five has to leave to get this three-point shooter on a complete reverse, you will see four does that X action that I talked about. And now four is the new middle and five is the new forward, okay? So this is action that you have to drill because this is, this is unique. You're not used to having this forward or somebody here going down to the middle and this person going out and becoming a new forward. But that's really what I meant by positionless. It's that ex amoeba action, which makes us 
that's where that unique amoeba action comes in to, to kind of counterbalance that two, three action, if that makes sense. I was going to say, coach, that's, that's where we, you know, ran into some issues when uh, we played a, a team that did a nice job, either like in that overload where the ball gets reversed and there's a one more into the corner and your center has to then rotate out there. Um, you know, that could put you in a, a tough position. I know this is a, a good example of it. Um, but I also like, and this is a question I would get a lot is, well, if the center goes out there and it's the forward learning that they have to replace and replace into the middle. And another uh, common one that comes up a lot, and I want to maybe ask you to talk about it a little bit, is when you have your guard, you know, man to man on someone, you know, up at the top and they, their person gets downhill and they stay with them and they then get downhill into the paint but then there's some type of kick back out to the top. And a lot of times a forward might have to rotate up and you end up kind of uh, replacing those spots on the floor to kind of keep the integrity of the zone. Uh, but it can create mismatches. And, and we really, I was fortunate to have a veteran team that they could kind of communicate and fix it on a reversal. And maybe those players could swap or another player could, could get into that spot. But, um, just curious if you could talk a little bit about that. I think with the diagrams, people can kind of visualize it probably a little bit more than me talking about it, but, you know, on that drive into the paint, when the guard has to follow, and then there's a kick out, what do you guys do in that situation? What does that look like for you? So I want to uh, skip to something so I can show this a little bit. So similar to what you said is based on a cut. And I'm going to, the reason I'm showing this real quick before I go back is the phrase bump and pass. Mm -hmm. I think that's really important. Kind of like I talked about on that close out, but then your teammate recovers and they push you back down. It's that same action of that bump and pass. So one and one and two, no, if they get beat, they have to now pass it to that next teammate who, who has to identify themselves as okay, you got beat. I got you. Don't worry. You bump back up to where you're supposed to be. Yep. Now, obviously, does that always work? No. But I think something key for us is kind of like I talked about position lists, is that even in practice, like every coach does these, you know, the one on one where you're in the lane and you know, and you're in that uh, alley with your that you're guarding somebody. We do that with everybody. We don't just do that with guards. We don't just do that with boards. My center is going one-on-one -on -one with somebody guarding somebody one-on-one, -on -one. you know, and the, and the same thing, when we talk about post defense, my guards are talking about how to guard the post. Um, so it, it's really, it just as an offense, you know, whether you're, whether you're talking to, you know, driving space or pacing space or, you know, whatever you want to use, where they're talking about that positionless, idea of offense you, you kind of have to think about defense in that positionless format in that you want to teach them all how to guard specific specific spots just like in man-to-man -man. nobody in a man-to-man -man would say to somebody oh well you're the post you can't guard somebody on the perimeter you of course if you're if your guy or girls on the perimeter you're going to go out and guard them so it's the same principles in our in our zone in that Hey, you might end up on the forward spot if you're the center. You may end up on the forward spot, uh, on the guard spot if you're a forward, but that's okay. We've drilled it. We've gone through. And I think one big thing for us defensively is it's going three on five. It's going four on five. It's going eight on five offensively, eight on five defensive players because it gets people to realize I only need to stop one thing. And that one thing is the ball going through the basket. It doesn't matter where the coach said I am in the zone, it's okay, I need to stop the ball going through the basket. My teammates not there. I'll help them and they'll hopefully help me back. But no matter what, I got to stop the ball from going in the basket. Yeah, that's, that's a great breakdown coach. And I think it helps when, you know, like I said, you get to see the diagram, um, but your approach to it, I, I really, really like. And I think coaches will be able to uh, you know, relate to that when you give the man-to-man -man example. So that, that's a really nice job explaining it because, you know, the I think of a matchup zone, it can be com complex at times, as you mentioned, uh, with some of the amoeba principles and the center going out and the forward coming down. So 
uh, some of that can can be complex. And I want to ask you, how do you break that down for your players? I, I had a chance to watch a game film before we got on the air, and I saw how well they communicate, how well they rotate in the zone um, and just close out to the ball and work just five players as one. So I got to see it firsthand, and I know coaches will – get to see some clips a little bit later on um, as well. But how do you drill some of that stuff to players? Are there any breakdown drills or anything that you do that's special that helps your players to learn how to do this so well? So I, I'll start with, I, I think it's, a, a, I think it's many folds, but um, I, I think first it starts off with, like I said, you want to start small in that one-on-one, -on -one, you know, defensive stuff. Like, it doesn't matter where you're playing, man. It doesn't matter if you're in zone one, three, one, two, three, you know, whatever it's, you got to guard your man. And uh, so many people love the phrase guard your yard in man to man defensive principles. When we say own your zone, like you got to own your zone. If somebody beats you in your zone or if somebody out rebounds you in your zone, take that personally. Um, you know, as far as, as defensively, I know Chris Beard at, well, now Texas, formerly Texas Tech, does the kill drill. Um, for those of you that the coaches that have never heard of the kill drill, it's about getting stops for, you know, a 60 seconds, 70 seconds, a minute or a minute and a half. You know, we do that in our zone. Um, you know, we, we will do drills where uh, it's as specific as you don't have your hands up. Well, guess what? Now we're doing some cardio. You didn't, you got beat in a straight line drive. Well, now we're doing some cardio. So it's, it's really, it's repping the small stuff that those would be the key things for me. Um, you know, we do all the different man to man drills that you can think of a back tap drill, uh, one on one lane alley drill. It, it's all those man to man things. And like I said, it's those man to man principles, uh, you know, in a little bit, I'll show a clip, but you know, if the ball's on the wing, I want that top guard on the ball. I want her guarding with that top foot above the offensive player's feet because I don't want her to reverse to that other side. Uh, you know, I want her to flow towards that forward and our forwards are great at stunt, reverse, stunt, reverse, stunt, reverse. So it, it's all those, just, it's those little breakdowns that, you know, it, they may not seem like a big thing or those little things like, you know, that guard forcing that, that person not to be able to reverse the ball that just makes it easier on, everybody else. The other thing I'll say is I have, I'm lucky enough to have three assistants. And I think it's so important that your assistant coaches buy into what you're trying to sell to the players. If they buy in and you buy in, then the players start to buy in. And the last thing I'll say is, you know, this might not be a fancy drill or a fancy, you know, it's getting the players to believe in it. If they believe in what you're doing, then they're able to ask the, my favorite question, which is why we're doing it. Hey coach, why are we doing this? Oh, okay. This is why we're doing this. Or my other favorite is when they say, how do I defend X, Y, Z? And then you say, how do you tell them how you defend or you want to defend X, Y, Z? My favorite is when the player comes back and counters you and says, you know what coach, what if we did it like this? And sometimes I'll say, you know what? Your way's better. So I think it's empowering the player and the assistant coach to just, you know, if they see something, say something and, and knowing that I don't have all the answers. I don't pretend to have all the answers. I don't want to have all the answers. So I think those are, those are definitely keys to repping it and drilling it. Yeah, that's, that's great advice for coaches and a lot of great points there, coach. And you know we've had a chance to look at, you know, the basic premise we saw, some of the amoeba principles when that one more pass to the corner, the overload piece, and also passing and bumping cutters, or at least a little bit about that. So what are some of the other things that, you know, coaches need to know when it comes to working with your matchup zone? So I think it depends on how you want to defend just different actions. So for example, for us, on the skip pass, I call the skip pass Merry Christmas. Um, I've had forwards that are great at this. So this backside forward, you're setting this player up to, okay, great. Skip it. Let's go. We love to create deflections. We love to create turnovers. 
our defense is all about our offense. We scored over, uh, over 50 points this year on an average, you know, and it, it all starts with our defense. Uh, and, and it, those turnovers, those deflections, they don't happen by accident. Uh, so this, this forward on the backside on any skip pass, we, I like to use the phrase, we like to use the phrase bait and jump. So you're going to bait this passer and then you're going to jump that pass. And we'll rep all the, the same things a man-to-man coach does, which is the outside hand, um, you know, the, the, the feet, the everything to turn it into a turnover. And my favorite part about the zone is once we create this backside turnover, now this person's got a friend who's coming with her against this one defender. So I think that's, that's definitely something that you want to think about is how to defend a skip. Uh, the other thing we talked about is uh, obviously versus this, this screen. Now you can kind of see this X action. So X one would have been screened. So X two knows I got to get over here. I'm not the one screened. And now X one can drop where X two came from the high post. So for any coach that wants to do this, this is something that has to be majorly repped because anytime, and we still do this and we're four years into this, Anytime the ball goes into the high post, and I can quiz you, coach, what is every other defender going to do for a split second? I would say they're all probably going to turn and stare at that ball at the high post. And next thing you know, it's a shot or a dump inside, or there's something, a skip opposite. There's something happening out of that. (laughs) Yes, sir. So we, and we have to rep this at the beginning of every season and we get better at it. But when that ball goes into the high post, we are essentially man to man. We teach our forwards uh, on the bottom to pinch. We call it pinch and fan, uh, which is normal two, three action. But depending on where the rest of the the teammates are, we might just go straight man. So if the ball goes here, this this person knows that they're going to close out. Now, for the majority of coaches, they put their center in the middle, which for us is great because for the most, most part, at least in high school basketball in Illinois, a lot of the times the center is not a great shooter. So that's fine with us we know that the center is going to drive or kick it back out. So we may give them some space. And I may tell my girl that's closing on that center, close on her right side or close on her left side. And then essentially, depending on where they are, if they put somebody in the short corner, I may have this person front the short corner because let's be honest against the zone. Almost everybody does what they go high post short corner or high post, low post or low post short corner or two high posts. So it's, you see the same actions. And I think that's another advantage for you in the matchup zone is, your kids by game 20, like I have a young lady who this will be her four, uh, fourth year as a varsity starter. She's seen every single thing a team's going to do against the matchup zone. Like everybody does the same things. So um, the last thing I wanted to cover was um, if you see something unique, don't be afraid to call a timeout and have that idea in your head of, hey, we've never seen this before. So this is how we're going to rep it because somebody may come up with something unique. Um, so don't be afraid to ever call a timeout and just uh, draw up for your kids. Like, Hey, this is what they're doing. This is how you can adjust. If a coach wants to use this and, and um, you know, with the team that's never done it before um, what, what's that learning curve like? And what are some of the key points that, you know, you typically, share with your team that you feel like might be helpful for other coaches? So I think the first thing is, is as I kind of mentioned before, but I'm going to mention again is under understand and tell your team what shot you're okay. Giving up. We're all going to give up something. There's no basketball team in a high school that gives up 40, you know, 40 points uh, every game, always forever and ever. So understand that sometimes the other team's going to hit some shots. Your team has to know, okay, I gave up this shot, but this was an okay shot for me to give up. And for us, it corresponds with our offense. My players know don't ever shoot a long two. So defensively, they know it's okay to give up a long two. You may, as a coach, feel like, hey, I'm not going to give up anything at the basket. I'll be okay. I'll live giving up a long shot. That's fine. So I think I would start there. That's the number one thing is, Tell your kids what you're okay with living with. If the other team for us, if the other team hits 20 long twos, we're going to tip our hat and say, great game. I would say the second thing is you need to decide where you want to shade the ball. Do you want to have more towards the baseline? Do you want to have it more towards the middle? 
again, that's your preference. Like I said, to start, I was a pack line guy to, to start as a head coach. And I never, ever wanted the ball towards the baseline. Now I teach our kids don't give up the middle. So again, I think it's, it's that second point is decide. And then it's to decide what you want your defense to do. So for what I mean by that is, do you want to just be like a Tony Bennett, Virginia, and understand you don't ever want to let that, that ball go through the basket? That's fine, but then you may have to give up some transition opportunities. For us, we like those transition opportunities. For us, we want 80 possessions in the game because I want to play 10, 11 kids every game. So for us, it's we want to be a little bit more aggressive. We want to create those deflections, create those steals to create offensive opportunities. So I, I think I would start with, even before I get into the little, the, the drills and the footwork and all those things, decide defensively what shot you want to give up, how you want to defend, and what you want to do within your defense. If you understand those three things and you're able to explain them, then I think you have a good start. And the last thing is, you need to have an answer for their question. So if you have those three things decided, you'll have an answer because you may say, okay, we're going to go under the screen, but we're going to go under the screen because we want to give up the jumper. You may say, hey, we're going to defend the skip pass like this. Like for us, we want to go for the steal. But you know what? If we're going to go for the steal, sometimes I have to understand that if we miss the steal, you may give up a little bit of a drive to that center. So it's, it's understanding what you're okay with as a coach and then living that because you can't say to a player, Hey, I'm okay with that. Oh my God. They hit a long two. Where were you? Well, coach, you just told me it was okay. If I gave up the long two, now you can't get on me. I can't give, I can't take away everything coach. So that those are where I would start. Yeah. Building that basic foundation. And, and really coach, I love what you said there with the players understanding, you know, what, what do we want to give up here? Are we going under the screen? Are we coming over the screen in situations or whatever it is? And as you mentioned, those long two pointers for players to understand that's something we might be okay with defensively. Uh, it goes a long way. You understand, they understand those basic principles of the defense. And then, you know, you get into some of the other intricate details. So that's great advice for coaches. And, you know, we saw sort of the diagrams, the X's and O's, and now I'm excited to take a look at this in action and see some film. So let's jump into it. So as I said, we kind of started this uh, in a regional championship game. We were playing a team who wasn't great against a man-to-man -man press and we had been zone all year, but my varsity assistant had kind of said to me like, Hey, this team doesn't handle a man-to-man -man press very well. And I was like, well, you know, we've never really man-to-man -man pressed against a, a team in fell into our zone. So these were kind of some clips just from a regional championship where we started in a man. So as you can see, we start in a man. We, we wanted to force that person to go towards the sideline. So right now we may be dropping into a, a two, three into our amoeba, but as you can see, man, 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 you can even see this player, even though I'm not sure how big of a fan I am. She's staring at the person, but we, went into this man-to-man -man look right here. And then eventually we will fall into our zone. So that was one clip of kind of how we went into from the man to the zone. So in this clip, as you can see, we were into a man and we're still in that man. Now, this is all based on read. As you can see, they were able to create the steal. Now, as I said, we wanna use those steals to create transition baskets. And again, going along with our defense, we work a lot on transition offense. So we know where to run into that layup. So that was one example of how our man created some time into our, into our offense. So this clip was from my second year and my first year trying this style. Now, as we've gone into this year, again, it's about creating those turnovers. I'm gonna show a couple different ways we create the turnovers. So on this skip pass, as you could see, the, the, the girl closes out, this one's going high post, my center is belly to the ball, and my forwards are here. They're basically matched up in a man-to-man. -man. 
Now, we want to make sure that we create the steel in any way we can. And we teach, I don't care if you kick it, punch it, hit it with your head, whatever you got to do. We just want to create that steel and then we are off to the races. So that's uh, definitely one uh, area that we try to do to create steals. And then finally, in this game, I really wanted to, to show, because we had talked about how to defend the high post. So here you could see our forwards are up. As I talked about, our guard is going to do a phenomenal job. She's got that high foot. The ball is entered into the high post. Now, as I said, the forwards both pinched as they should. This guard fanned this guard fanned and they essentially made it a one-on-one. -on -one. So that's how we would defend the high post. Here, as you can see, look how high, most people would be like, coach, your zone is way too high. Well, we're trying to give the look here that we're in man. So this is a great matchup zone look that we're in man. My center moved all the way up. She's not near the basket. My forwards are up like they're guarding. And we're going to give that illusion that we're in the man-to-man. -man. The other look I wanted to give is what we look like out of our one, two, two, three quarter. So as you can see, we're in the one, two, two, three quarter. They break it and we're going to fall right back in to our one, our two, three matchup zone. And again, we got that steal. I want to show that because that's key. We got that steal because my guard's feet were higher than hers and she was leading it towards the forward. So here, the ball's gonna enter into the high post. We do a nice job. This young lady knows where she is. She knows where she is. She knows where she is. And she knows where she is because we're not gonna allow this back out. This girl travels and we are able to create the turnover out of the matchup. So coach really like the breakdown there of the different pressure that you put on teams. I I'm feeling like we have another one of these down the road. We're going to talk pressure defense and that's uh, probably even more exciting. I love the matchup zone, but uh, just love what you guys do defensively. Um, and I wanted to ask you about that last clip uh, when the ball does go into a low post. I know the high post, you have your forwards pinching, your guards fanning. Um, but curious, when the ball does go into a low post, I think you talked a little bit about it in that clip. But what do you guys like to do in, in that situation once the ball does come into the low post? So the, the center is going to, first of all, be basically man-to-man. -man, but the ball side forward, just like in a regular man-to-man, -man, that ball side forward, their butt's going to drop to the baseline. They're going to drop down, and this is very pack line man of me to say, but they're going to really dig, uh, and they're going to really get that hand under the ball, and as that, if that post player wants to dribble, they're going to pop up at it. Um, so on the backside forward, you're really just ensuring that those two, if there's two on that backside, you kind of have the two because that, that ball side guard and that ball side forward are really going to dig down on the post. So it's almost going to create a triangle around the post that you you're going to probably kick back out. Cause we're really not going to give up that look too, too often. As coaches are watching this, if there was just one piece of advice that you would give to them, I know you gave us some a breakdown of some things if they want to implement this with their team, but just one, one piece of advice to get started. I think at times you're, it's going to, it's going to look a little messy, especially in practice as you're first putting it in, but don't give up on it. Understand that there's going to be different scenarios that, like I said, that you may have not seen and that you may have to just try to figure out how you're going to defend. And every team's going to have different personnel to decide how to defend. You may come into a team where there's four shooters that you're going to have to defend against. You may come into a team where there's two low post players. So I think the key is just like with any defense is if you're going to buy into it, buy into it. If you're going to try to do it halfway, it's probably not going to look very good, just like with anything else. So my biggest piece of advice would be if you're going to do it, buy into it with your heart and soul and understand that sometimes it's not going to look very good, but as they learn how to do it, it's going to look, it's going to look better and better. And your, your team's going to really buy into it. Um, as far as contacting me, uh, you're more than welcome to contact me. Um, I'm on Twitter myself. 
uh, at Coach Palicki. Uh, so it's P-A-L-I-C-K-I. You're more than welcome to reach out to me on Twitter. Or if you want to email me at my res account, it's uh, J-P-A-L-I-C-K-I at R-E-S-H-S dot org. Well, thanks for sharing that, Coach. And I feel like there's a lot of great information here for coaches to digest and really think about it is if this is something that they want to use with their team. As I said, I, I very similar to what you're doing, uh, use, use with my team and had a lot of success with it. So I really appreciate you sharing this. As I said earlier, I feel like there's not a lot of stuff out there on matchup zones, a lot of questions that coaches often ask, and you did a great job, you know, breaking down some of the details for coaches who are watching this. Well, again, I, I greatly appreciate you having me on. You have much bigger uh, star coaches than me. So thank you for having me on. And, and like I said, anytime any coach wants to talk basketball, please reach out. Absolutely, coach. And I think I'm going to be reaching out again to talk about your pressure defenses down the road. So I'll be hitting you up again. But uh, thank you for uh, joining me today. Thank you.